Hello, I'm Rabbi Elton from the Great Synagogue in Sydney and welcome to From the Rabbi's Bookshelves. This is the third and final part in our series on the thought of Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Berkowitz. And now we're going to turn to his Holocaust theology. Rabbi Berkowitz himself was a Holocaust survivor of sorts. He was in Berlin in the 1930s. He was present during the rise of Hitler and the Nazi regime for escaping to uh, Leeds in England in the late 1930s. Furthermore, his beloved teacher, Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, was much more caught up in the Holocaust itself, although as a Polish citizen he was eventually sent to a different sort of camp than a concentration camp. He in fact rescued his uh, teacher's writings and they were published as his responsa later in life. So when Berkowitz approaches post-Holocaust theology and understanding how we can retain faith in a loving God and in Jewish uh, practice and Jewish life, even after the Holocaust he isn't speaking from a detached standpoint, he's speaking as somebody who endured much of the suffering that was brought about, at least in the 1930s, if not the 1940s. And the book he produced was called Faith After the Holocaust. His essential argument in this volume is that God must give humanity free will. It is the essential nature of man's dignity that he has free will, he can choose either good or bad. And therefore, there's always the possibility he will choose bad. And if he chooses bad, then the innocent will suffer. And therefore, we cannot ask why the Holocaust happened, because the answer to that question is because man exists. And the ultimate decision is whether man should exist or not. But if he is going to exist, then there will sometimes be terrible consequences for the innocent, and the Holocaust was one such example of that. His own words are the most eloquent, so I shall read them to you. In a sense, God can be neither good nor bad. In terms of his own nature, he is incapable of evil. He is the only one who is goodness. But since because of his very essence he can do no evil, he can do no good either. God being incapable of, our, of the unethical is not an ethical being. Goodness for him is neither an ideal nor a value, it is existence. It is absolutely realised being. Justice, love, peace, mercy are ideals for man only. They are values that may be realised by man alone. God is perfection. Yet because of his very perfection he is lacking, as it were, one type of value, the one which is the result of striving for value. He is all light. On just that account, he is lacking the light that comes out of the darkness. One might also say that with man, the good is axiology, with God, ontology. Man alone can strive and struggle for the good, but God is good. Man alone creates value, God is value. But if man alone is a creator of values, one who strives for the realization of ideals, then he must have freedom of choice and freedom of decision and his freedom must be respected by God himself. God cannot, as a rule, intervene whenever man's use of freedom displeases him. It is true, if he did so, the perpetration of evil would be rendered impossible, but so would the possibility for good also disappear. Man can be frightened, but he cannot be bludgeoned into goodness. If God did not respect man's freedom to choose his course and personal responsibility, not only would the moral good and evil be abolished from the earth, but man himself would go with them. For freedom and responsibility are the very essence of man. Without them, man is not human. If there is to be man, he must be allowed to make his choices in freedom. If he has such freedom, he will use it. Using it, he will often use it wrongly, for he will decide for the wrong alternative. As he does so, there will be suffering for the innocent. The question is therefore not, why is there undeserved suffering, but why is there man? He who asks the question about injustice in history really asks, why a world? Why creation? To understand this is, of course, far from being able to answer our problem. But to see a problem in its true dimension makes it easier for us to make peace with the circumstances from which it arises. It is not very profitable to argue with God as to why he created this world. He obviously decided to take his chance with man. He decided for the world. Given man, God himself could eliminate moral evil and suffering caused by it only by eliminating man, by recalling the world of man into nothingness. This is not just a account of theology after the Holocaust, it's also a call for responsibility. The Holocaust is no one's responsibility but humanity's itself. God gave man the choice to do good or evil, and therefore as man, as humanity, we have to choose to do the good. That's the only way that a Holocaust can be averted in the future, and the way to keep faith is to understand the responsibility and the dignity that God has given us. Thanks for joining.